From CBS 2 News, this is a special report. Mayor de Blasio is giving an update on the coronavirus pandemic in New York City. Let's listen in. There are days and won't be able to overcome this crisis. You already see people talking about uh, what we may have lost in this crisis. There's no question a lot of pain has happened, an immense amount of pain. There's no question that we've lost people dear to us. There's no question that so many of our small businesses are struggling and are going to struggle to come back. But there is, in my mind, also no question that New York City will come back strong, stronger than ever. This is what New York City does. This is who we are. This is what we've always done. I get very upset when I see people betting against New York City, when I even see New Yorkers putting down New York City. Uh, they need to go and read a little bit of history. They need to go and understand how many times this city has been put back on its heels and fought its way back. They need to spend a little time with everyday New Yorkers who've got a lot of fight in them. We're going through a lot. We're going through a lot of pain. But we will unquestionably come back. And we will learn powerful lessons and we will act on those lessons because that is who we are. There are so many instances where that's clear. Think about what happened after 9-11. A lot of places might never have been able to find a way back after something as horrifying as 9-11. This city fought back. We remembered the heroes we lost, but we were inspired by their example. Think about Hurricane Sandy, worst natural disaster in the history of this city. So literally, 9-11, worst attack on the city in our history. Sandy, worst natural disaster in our history, people fought back. Those extraordinary efforts at the grassroots to help each other just in the hours immediately after the storm hit, the way people came together and helped each other in neighborhoods all over the city, and then the way people fought back and rebuilt. Learned lessons, did things better. We will rebuild, we will be stronger. There is no question. It does not in any way minimize or ignore the pain that we are going through now. But it is, an, to me, so clear who we are and that we will find a way back. And it's important to remember, even as we grieve, that is the nature of this place to work together and to build something new. That's always been the history of this city. So we're going to build something new and we're going to build something better and not just better because it's more modern. We're going to build something more fair. We're going to build something for everyone. This recovery has to have that spirit, that New York spirit that everyone matters. Doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, everyone needs to be included. And we need to build a better and more just society than the one we left behind. I don't want to see recovery mean let's just go back to the status quo we had before. I don't think that's what's going to work, and I don't think it's fair. Recovery means making something better. And we have it in our power to do that, even as we're in the midst of this pain and this challenge. New Yorkers know in our hearts, but we don't give up. It's in our DNA. We don't give up. And we find a way to create. And a lot of times, a lot of people out there listening, if I said more than once in your life you've made something out of nothing, you know what I mean. And this city can't tell you how many times in our history people said it was all over. The 60s, people were leaving the city in drove. In the 70s, the fiscal crisis all the other challenges we've faced. This city was written off more times than I can count. This city came back stronger every time. Now we're going to come back stronger and fairer. We're going to learn the powerful lessons of this horrible tragedy. We're not going to allow the disparities that we've seen to exist in the future. We'll fight every single day. We know these are intractable problems, or at least they seem to be intractable. We're going to find ways to beat them back and make profound changes, as only New Yorkers can make. So today, I'm going to start talking to you about 
how we're going to approach this. And this is going to be a long effort. It's going to be the next 20 months of my administration and then far beyond. But today I'm going to talk to you about some of the building blocks we're going to put in place to get us to that restart and that recovery. I'm going to talk about four specific pieces of our strategy. Again, these are just the initial building blocks, as I said, some of the ways we're going to put together the deeper plans, the more specific plans that will move us forward. We've got a lot of work to do. And it's going to be, for me and my team, a nonstop effort, a race to the finish line over these next 20 months to do the most we can to put this city on the strongest possible footing for the future. Everyone wants to know about the restart, and that discussion is going to happen over these next few weeks. We're obviously watching our health care indicators every day. I'll talk about them again in a few minutes. They will tell us a lot about the timing of what we can do. We're working right now on what each element of a restart looks like, and it will not all happen at once. I'm going to keep cautioning. Restart happens in careful, smart phases, because the last thing we're ever going to do is allow this disease to reassert itself. We're not going to risk people's lives. We're going to be smart about it. But that work of framing the restart is going on right now, and we're going to bring in a lot of people to help us, and I'll talk about that. And then we have to focus on these disparities in everything we do. They've been laid bare in this crisis. We have to talk about how we fight these disparities now, in the work we're doing now, and then in a much deeper, bigger way going forward. The economic and racial disparities that have been made so clear by this crisis, we knew about them before. They've been just a powerful, painful exclamation point has been put on them by this crisis. It is a clarion call to us to start right now fighting back against those disparities and to build a deeper plan to fight them on a more permanent basis. So you're going to see a lot in the next few weeks about the immediate efforts to restart the first steps, and then over the weeks ahead and the months ahead, a deeper vision of what a fair recovery looks like. So again, not just let's get back to the status quo that was before, but something different and better and fairer. And it's going to be a reimagination of what this city could be. We are the greatest city in the world. Before the coronavirus hit, the city was in an amazing point in our history with an economy so strong, with a constant effort to include more and more people in what this city has to offer and what it can mean for all of us, a, a growing reality that we could include everyone in our prosperity and our strength. We've got to take that and build something much bigger to truly make this a city for all. And we have to look at our basic laws, our basic government structure, we have to look at the whole thing to think about how we can much more deeply ensure a fair recovery. So I'm going to be talking to you again about some of the initial steps that will help us with the first acts of restarting. I'm going to be talking about the immediate and ongoing effort to address the disparities. I'm going to be talking about a bigger effort to create a vision for a fair recovery that then can be put into action. And I'm going to talk about how we consider the very reality of our government in this moment of crisis and where it needs to take us in the future. And I'm going to bring in a lot of very, very talented people to help augment all we do here at City Hall and our agencies. This is a moment where we're going to invite in uh, tremendously smart, innovative New Yorkers from many, many parts of our city, many different parts of our life of the city, of our economy, bring their brain power, their ideas, their perspectives to help us do all we do. So the restart is the first thing in our mind. We know it directly interrelates with what we're learning about this virus and its presence in our city and those indicators. We're going to constantly talk about where we stand each day, what kind of element of restart we can think about now, what we have to think about later. Remember, when you think about restart, think about those indicators going down, let us pray, always going down, and then think about the testing and tracing that we talked about a few days ago, that really widespread effort to test as many New Yorkers as possible, 
trace their contacts when needed, isolate people who need isolating. Those strands need to come together, and we're preparing for them to come together in the first two weeks of May so that we can really go on the offensive. But again, the health care indicators have to give us that all clear so we can start that effort. And we need the supply of testing, which is still a big open question here, to pull those pieces together. OK, let's start with the question of when we restart. We restart when we have evidence. Look, we see some states around the country rushing to restart their economies. I'm worried for them. I'm worried for their people. Some seem to be paying attention to health care indicators more than others. Anybody, any state, any city that doesn't pay attention to those factual health care indicators, that evidence is running a risk, is endangering their own people. And their whole idea of wanting to rush a restart so we can have an economy again and recover, it could all backfire because the disease reasserts you're delaying potentially by a long time when you could have that kind of recovery. We won't let that happen here. We will focus first and foremost on the health and safety of New Yorkers, protecting our health care system so it can be there for all of us, making our moves when the indicators tell us, and then making them piece by piece, testing to see how they're working, making sure that each step we take is a strong foothold before we take the next step. So that's the when, how. How do we restart? There's so many open questions, and the people we're going to bring together are going to help us answer them with their powerful perspective on the life of the city and the different parts of the city they come from, the different industries, et cetera. They're going to bring perspective so we can get these decisions right. So here are kinds of questions that we all have to ask. And, and again, some of these will be things we do earlier. Some of these will be things we do later. But here are obvious everyday questions. How do you reopen? a restaurant and still do it in a way that protects the customers and protects the people that work there. How do you do that right? What kind of protection will people need? What kind of PPEs will people need to wear in a lot of different parts of the city, a lot of different work that they do to make sure they're safe? When will they need more? When will they need less? We've got to start to fill in those blanks. How much will we be doing temperature checks? or symptom checks on a regular basis, where, how. They're clearly powerful tools. They fit our test and trace strategy. How are we going to do that? How extensively? Are we going to have enough thermometers? All sorts of basic questions have to be answered to determine what's our ideal, but also practically, what can we get done at any given moment? What kind of cleaning protocols will businesses need as they restart? What kind of social distancing will be required in the business? How many customers can be there at any given time? All of these answers need to be filled in. We have some really good information from around the world of some things we see working better and worse. We're going to borrow on that from that and, and use it as we formulate our plans. And this is all going to move fast because we have to be ready for that moment where the indicators tell us it's time to open up a little. But I want to be clear, there's no on-off switch here. It's not like, I think people know it, but I want to say it for emphasis, it's not like there's ever one jump back to normalcy. It's a series of careful, smart moves. And then you test each one along the way to make sure there's not that backfire. And then when you see things working, you take the next step. Now, to help us on this journey and to help us immediately, I am going to bring together people who really know their communities, their industries. People bring a huge amount of expertise. So we're going to have a set of advisory councils, and it's going to be sector by sector in our city. We're going to get these folks together very quickly. They're going to start meeting in the first week of May, so literally in a matter of days. I'll be meeting with each of them. My team will be meeting with them constantly. We need to get this perspective from the folks at the front line of every part of the city's life. We'll have small business as its own council. We'll have larger businesses in their own council. They have different needs. We want to account for both. We need both to come back strong. We're going to have one for public health and health care, obviously so crucial in this fight. But we have to make sure strong, to say the least, for the future, because we don't know what the future brings. And it's a crucial part of our city to begin with. 
arts, culture, tourism, which we're so proud of, such a big part of our city, they all will come back strong. We want to figure out the right way to get that started and then build upon that. So these councils are going to get together immediately to help us frame the restart, but they'll stay with us for weeks and months to come as we build out our actions to open up and then to envision our future and build our future. There'll be one for labor. We have to hear from the folks who represent working people and determine what we need to do for working people. Nonprofits and social services, huge part of New York City life and our economy often are not given the credit they deserve. They're going to have a council. I'm going to be meeting with them because we need that part of our city to come back strong. The faith-based community. We already have extraordinary efforts with Coral, with the Council of Religious Leaders, with our uh, clergy advisory board. We're going to bring them together to help guide us in thinking about how we restart the life of faith in this city, but also the crucial role that faith-based communities can play in rebuilding our economy, making sure people are protected, making sure people have what they need in their lives, even in this struggle. And education and vocational training, obviously bringing back our public schools strong, bringing them back safely, dealing with the trauma the kids and families and educators have gone through, thinking also about all parts of our education system, how we work with our religious education uh, schools, how we work with private schools, higher education, vocational training, all of them will be at the table to help us think through this restart. So we're gonna start right away. It's gonna be very practical and specific about what we need to do together and then also be part of how we build our bigger plans. So that's immediate. Another immediate piece, and it'll start with immediate actions the city government needs to take and build out as part of the bigger vision, is a city task force on racial inclusion and equity. This will be made up of leaders of the city government, focusing on the disparities we're seeing already, making sure that we are addressing structural racism that is obviously present in the realities we're facing with this disease, making sure we take immediate actions through all the agencies of the city government to address this painful reality. This is a right now thing. Right now we can start to address these disparities. We're doing it in many ways on the healthcare front with the plans that we have announced, the community-based testing and the outreach programs, the community-based health clinics, many other things working on right now. But I wanna make sure that every agency of the city government is moving in that same direction urgently. The task force will be led by our first lady, Shirley McRae, and by Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson. And this is based on ideas that they have both developed in the last few days to address the immediate disparities, but also to make sure that we address these disparities more thoroughly in our recovery plans ahead. Uh, we will be naming a group of leaders from the administration uh, who focus on and represent all communities of color in this city. And again, they will think about immediate things that need to happen that work with the community-based health clinics and providers, uh, how we can work right now with minority-owned businesses and obviously deepen our MWBE efforts right now, how we can support uh, essential workers. This task force will focus on those issues, but also build out and help us think about the bigger structural changes we need to make going forward. Now, those are some very immediate things that all build to the future, but let's now talk about the, the broader concept of recovery. Restart is necessary to recovery. Recovery means, to me, getting back not just to a point where life feels more normal, but getting back to a point of strength and addition, additionally addressing the underlying issues that we still need to address in this city. Certainly building back, but building better, building stronger, building fairer. So recovery starts with the restart, it starts with making sure we're all taking those steps back. We always, in that road to recovery, think about those four basics I've been talking about throughout that are governing our actions, our budget, everything, making sure people are healthy, safe, have food to eat, and a roof over their head. We have to get those basics to be 100% secure as we build out. We have to get people back to work 
This is central to everything. So many people are clamoring rightfully to get back to work the first moment it's safe. I want people back to work. I want to restart our economy. I want to see people back to work, whether they work on Wall Street or they work in a bodega. We need everyone back to work. We have to do it the right way and get our bigger economy going so it'll support everything else we do. So when you think about all the pieces we have to pull together, it's not just a restart. It's not just the mechanics of how you start your economy again. It's not just a recovery in the sense of, okay, we have a functioning city. We don't just need a recovery, we need a transformation. We need to go much farther. We need to take this painful, difficult moment and turn it into something that we can build upon for a better city. So this is where I want to talk about the concept of a fair recovery. The crisis has laid bare so many things that are broken in our city and in our country. There have been so many amazing acts of heroism. Let's praise the good, the heroism from our healthcare workers, our first responders, the incredible things people have done for each other, the community, the amazing discipline and strength of New Yorkers with social distancing and shelter in place. There have been many heroic positive stories, but also extraordinarily painful and clear inequalities. So we see it over and over again. We see working families who have been brought to their knees in a matter of weeks, and there's not enough safety net there for them. And we finally are seeing some progress from our federal government, but our federal government's always been behind the curve, not dealing with the reality and only coming up with very partial solutions. So for so many working families, this has been a devastating time. We see the federal government focusing on the wealthy and corporations before working people. It's painful to acknowledge how much of the stimulus discussion in the beginning was about big business, not small business and about a payday for those who are already wealthy and privileged, not those who are struggling. And the federal government here in this case, it's been consistently the case, not only behind the curve, but the focus has been all wrong. Our federal government was much quicker to bail out the airlines, $58 billion, than to focus on cities and states and working people. These contradictions are now clearer than ever, and they're more unacceptable than ever. So as we fight what's broken, as we fight these inequalities, we draw upon what we've done over these six years, the whole reason we all came here to do this work. And it came through in so many ways leading up to this crisis, and we've seen it vividly during this crisis. Thank God. Our focus was on health care equity, saving our public hospitals, creating a guarantee of health care and making sure people could get insurance or if they couldn't get insurance, had the right to health care through NYC care, building up access to free mental health care across the board through Thrive NYC. These acts of equity are serving us right now in this crisis. They're reminders of how much more we have to do as well and fighting for economic fairness, $15 minimum wage, paid sick leave, rent freezes, the things that we have done to try to bring a beginning of fairness and equity to the city. We need to do even more now. As we've talked about this crisis, I've said it very bluntly, the only comparison we can make in terms of what it's meant to people's livelihoods, their their family reality, their economic reality, the only comparison is the Great Depression. And I heard those stories from my older relatives, and when they spoke about the Great Depression, it sounded like it was yesterday. It was so vivid, it was so intense. The challenges they faced, the pain that they overcame somehow. But it's also clear in those stories, and I bet a lot of you have heard them too, and it's very much a New York story. When you talk about how our nation fought back through the Great Depression, it was very much through the leadership of great New Yorkers like Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Fiorella LaGuardia, giants uh, that uh, we can only think of with awe. And in our time, we look to them for inspiration. Well, 
They did not say, let's just rebuild what was happening that day before the stock market crashed in 1929. I want you to remember this. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Fiorella LaGuardia, and all the other great leaders of the New Deal, they did not say, we just want to go back to that horribly unequal, volatile, unfair world of 1929. No, they said, we're going to build something transformational and different. That was the New Deal. They reimagined what government could be. They reimagined what it could mean for people. And they very much made clear that it was not going to be a government for the few, but a government for the many. The visions that they put forward, the policies they created were for all. And it was a sea change. It was a break point in the history of this country. By the way, the things that came from that noble fight we live with today because the ideas were so good, so durable, so right, that they still frame, thank God, so much of what we do as a nation now. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, just reach for your Social Security card, and you'll have a great example right there. We need to build a group of people to help us come up with the same ideas, the same kind of ideas, I should say, the same creative, innovative, forward-looking ideas when you think about what these great leaders and thinkers were doing in the first half of the 1930s, they were coming up with ideas that had never been heard of before. They were seeing the world in a whole new way. They were doing things at the time that people said were impossible, but they made them happen. And we all have benefited generation after generation from it. We have to find the ideas for our time. We have to dream new dreams. And we need great thinkers to help us do it. And so I'm appointing today a fair recovery task force. And this is an extraordinary group of New Yorkers, each of whom has contributed to this city in really profound ways. They bring different perspectives, different ideas, but all have a common thread. They have devoted so much of their lives to building a better New York City and a fairer society. And they all have the impulse to lift people up. They all have the impulse to say the status quo is not good enough. We have to do better. And we can do better. And every one of them has that energy and that spirit to build something new and better. And I'm bringing them together to help all of us, to advise me, to help us create the plans for now and for the future. And it's a group of people I think will make New York City proud. Let me introduce each one to you, first of all. And this will be a group of uh, people in common thinking together. Uh, and each of them brings so much to the table. First, Patrick Gaspard. Uh, Patrick is a New Yorker through and through, uh, born to Haitian parents, uh, grew up in New York City, went to our public schools, served in the Obama administration, now president of the Open Society Foundations, one of the most important philanthropies on earth, someone who served right here in City Hall, loves this city, and believes things can be created and has been part of it all over the world. Dick Ravitch, former lieutenant governor of New York State, a legend. Uh, Dick Ravitch is one of the people that helped this city survive the fiscal crisis of the 1970s, one of the great innovators who saw us through. He helped save the MTA in the 70s and 80s. He is someone who time and time again has seen what others could not see and helped us not just to come back, but come back stronger. His extraordinary experience will bring so much to this group. Jennifer Jones Austin. Uh, Jennifer is someone I have such appreciation for. She was the co-chair of my transition when I came into City Hall. She helped us build this administration as CEO of the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies. She's a leader in this city in so many ways in our nonprofit sector in the work of social justice, in the work of the faith community, and her family is a, uh, four generations. She is the fourth generation of, of faith and social justice leaders in her family. She understands what it is to run a large nonprofit, and she understands how crucial those extraordinary nonprofits are to the city. She brings amazing perspective to this effort. And her co-chair uh, in that transition off, uh, in that transition effort uh, seven years ago, joining us as well, Carl Weisbrod. Carl has uh, done it all for New York City and most recently served as the chair of the City Planning Commission in my administration. 
He has served in one form or another in city administrations going back to the time of Mayor Lindsay. He is legendary for the work he did uh, taking a symbol of so many things that were troubled about New York City, Times Square, and turning it into something strong and vibrant. He knows what resurgence looks like. He played a crucial role in bringing back Lower Manhattan after 9-11 as well. I think one of the most respected leaders in government and civic life over the last half century in this city. Henry Garrido leads our largest municipal union, DC 37 AFSME, the people who do so much of the work that keeps this city going. Henry is a thinker and a change agent and a visionary. I have had many a long conversation over the years with Henry and he's always looking over the horizon. He also comes from the immigrant experience, his family from the Dominican Republic. He fights for working people, and believes we can do much better for working families. And he also has the extraordinary experience of running a huge uh, organization that's there to serve and uplift working people. Henry brings a great mind and a great spirit to this effort. Maria Torres Springer, Vice President for United States Programs at the Ford Foundation. Maria is someone who, in her 15 years of public service to our city, uh, hit the trifecta, if you will. She led three agencies. Very few people have done this and done it so well. She led various, various times our Economic Development Corporation, our uh, Small Business Services Department, and our Housing Department. She understands what it's like not only to run these large organizations, but to serve people who need the help now, folks who need affordable housing, the folks in our small business community who are going through so much now and need a helping hand. And she certainly understands what it means to foster economic strength, but from a perspective of fairness, child of Filipino immigrants, I remember when I first talked to her, the passion with which she spoke about helping working people and immigrants, she's going to bring that passion and all that experience to this group. Liz Newmark, CEO of Great Performances. She is an extraordinary New York City entrepreneur, a great New York City story. She started a small business that turned into a much larger business. Uh, now employs so many people all over this city, a New York success story, but not someone who just kept her success to herself. What Liz did was said, how can we turn business into an engine for change? She's led efforts uh, to empower people, to train people, to bring them into industries that previously uh, they didn't have an opportunity to participate in. She's worked tirelessly to fight hunger in this city. Uh, she's a great example of someone from our business community who every single day asks the question, how can we take our New York City businesses and make them agents of positive change in our city? And she has proven it over and over again that it can be done and it must be done. And finally, Fred Wilson. Fred is a legend in our technology community. Some consider him the godfather of the New York City tech scene. Uh, he was an early stage investor in many of the New York City tech companies that are thriving today. Uh, he's someone who uh, really had a profound vision, one of the first to have the vision of New York City as a great international tech hub, and now that vision has come to be true. Uh, but his true passion is making sure that our kids get computer science education. I've worked closely with Fred. I've been so impressed by his generosity, but also his extraordinary entrepreneurship and his drive. He created the Computer Science for All initiative that now has been one of the most successful elements of our initiatives at Equity and Excellence in our public schools. Because of Fred, uh, every child in New York City public schools is now getting computer science education. And he led that effort and now will bring that same drive and ingenuity uh, to this group. So an amazing collection of New Yorkers bringing so many different talents, so much perspective. This group will come together quickly and I'm gonna ask of them that they come up with an immediate product to frame our work. Now it's gonna be a preliminary product. They're all very, very talented, but I'm going to ask them to, in addition to their very busy day jobs, take some time to come up with a preliminary recovery roadmap by June 1st. This is not gonna be the final word, this is gonna be the first outline of how we build that smart recovery, that recovery that will work, that recovery that will be fair. I'll expect that 
preliminary roadmap by June 1st, but then their work will continue on in the months ahead. Finally, we need to uh, look at the bigger changes, and I've talked about what it's going to mean, that long road ahead, dealing with things like the inequities in our health care system, dealing with the challenge that New Yorkers faced still finding affordable housing, the profound issues that working people face, the huge issues of protecting this city and our ability to serve people going forward, and obviously the questions that will come back to the fore shortly of how we fight global warming and what the role of this city is in. I'm going to expect this group to work on all these things in the months ahead. Remember, we have 20 months to build this long-term fair recovery. I'm going to depend on them to help in every phase of that. But the last piece of the equation is the structural question of our government and everything that our government is built to do and what we need to do going forward. So the fourth thing I will do is I will plan in the days and weeks ahead to formulate and announce a charter revision commission. Uh, the announcement will come when we've put together uh, the team that will do this work. And again, this is something that will happen in the weeks ahead. First, we need to move, deal with the more immediate matters. But I think it is the right time for a charter revision commission because if ever there was uh, a moment, a breakpoint moment in the city's history, uh, this is it. And it's time to look anew at everything we do and see what works, what doesn't work, what about our city government structure might be outdated or less effective, what do we need to build a fair recovery. Charter Revision Commission will hold hearings all over the city. And again, hopefully someday soon there'll be public hearings again where people come in person and anything they have to do in the short term, if they need to do it virtually, they will. But I want this group to really think about the big picture of how our government works, how it serves our people, where we need to go for the future. So those are four pieces, four building blocks to building the strategies to get us through some of the immediate decisions and on into that broader fair recovery. I am convinced we can pull these pieces together and build something new and better. Now, the part of the day we always wait for, reviewing the indicators. And this has everything to say again with the restart. We've seen some good progress the last few days, and today is another good day. And I'm very happy about this. Now, the first indicator is unchanged, and I want to see it go down, but still, it's not going in the wrong direction. I am a guy who believes the glass is half full, so I'm happy to see uh, it's not going in the wrong direction. In many days, this one has gone in the right direction. Indicator one, daily number of people admitted to hospitals for suspected COVID, unchanged. Indicator two, number of people in ICUs across our health and hospital system for suspected COVID has gone down 785 to 768 percent of people tested who are positive for COVID-19 has gone down 30 percent to 29 percent now unfortunately this is uh, the one piece of this that is not so sunny public health health lab tests have gone up 31 percent to 46 percent but still when you look at this day and the days before, overall continuing to move in the right direction, seeing good signs, but I want to see all of these go down consistently for 10 to 14 days. That's what will signal those first steps in opening up. So I'm going to conclude before a few words in Spanish. Just want to focus on the word normal. So a crisis will end. I'm going to keep saying it. This crisis will end. We will come back. We will be a great city. We always have been a great city. Will we be normal again? People talk about this word a lot, and I understand it, and I relate to it the same way. Normal, in some ways, sounds like a very good thing right now, but normal isn't good enough for our future. Normal could be interpreted as the status quo we knew before the coronavirus. That's not the normal I'm aspiring to. I'm aspiring to something different and better. We have 20 months for this administration to run all the way to the finish line and really make sure we address these inequalities while building up a strong economy, while building up a strong city for all. I think we can do those things. I think we can pull those pieces together and really build something better. And that's what I'm devoted to. And that's what my whole team will be devoted to. 
a few words in Spanish. You've been listening to Mayor de Blasio give an update on the coronavirus pandemic in New York City. We're now returning to regular programming on CBS2. For extended local coverage, stick with our streaming service, CBSN New York. This has been a special report from CBS2 News. We now return to our regular programming.